Paramount's Halo show had a disaster of a first season. They didn't have the music, they constantly took Master Chief's helmet and armor off, Cortana looked and acted bizarrely, and there were buckets of random original characters eating up the screen time in place of fan favorites who were nowhere to be found. With that all in mind, Paramount has given the Halo show a second chance. So let's see if they were able to take in all the harsh feedback of Season 1 in order to make appropriate changes and salvage this mess the same way they did with Sonic. Full disclosure, I did not watch Season 1 myself. I merely watched other clips and reviews, and I came to the conclusion that this simply wasn't a Halo show, so I didn't want to waste my time on it. But hey, their trailers for Season 2 seems to promise change, with a larger focus on the original lore, and coverage of the Fall of Reach storyline, so I'm willing to start fresh and give them another chance to make things right. Chief? We're losing him. Sever the con- The opening scene is Master Chief naked on his deathbed crying. So, nah, they didn't fix it. After the opening shot, we cut through time, and we witness a refreshingly full-armored John Cheeks. They refer to him as Master Chief in the show, but that feels disingenuous, so I'll keep calling him by his real name. He's alongside his companions, Silver Team. Not to be confused with the well-liked and canon Blue Team, Silver Team consists of original characters that are unique to the show. We have Garblemouth. He gets that name because I can't understand a damn thing he says. You want me to call it a flicker? Nubian Ibex can scale an 80 degree slope. We have Kai. Her defining character traits are that she exists. And lastly, we have Riz. That's not some funny nickname I came up with. The show unironically named their character Riz. Riz, on me. 10 out of 10, best character. Perfect show, all's forgiven. Silver Team is currently on a desolate planet known as Sanctuary, and they're trying to assist the military in escorting a colony of humans off this planet because this area is under immediate threat of alien invasion. The team shares some banter. Then we cut to these marines who are established as being Christians for some reason. I'm a Baptist while also being portrayed as the bad guys in this situation. Hmm, I hope these writers know that Baptists and Rosaries don't exactly mix. These Marines are trying to aggressively bully these colonists into leaving their homes with demeanors that are similar to corrupt cops. Then we comply, our ass, Corporal. Ma'am, place your hand. Because if Halo is known for anything, it's known for its negative portrayal of the Marines, right? This old lady, which they refer to as a shaman priest person. It's this lady, sir. She's some sort of shaman priest person. She doesn't want to leave this planet because the military already moved her from their warm, lovely planet into this crappy new one, so they don't trust the military anymore. She also states that their faith permits them to protect their planet no matter what. And don't those two concepts make so much sense? Right now, I'd appreciate I understand you're the same that came before. Excuse me? To our first home. On that planet, it was warm. On that planet, they were fish. Our faith tells us that to leave our planet in its time of torment is no different than to abandon a dying child or parent. These are the opening scenes of the show. These are the scenes that the showrunners deliberately chose to give us a first impression with. Amazing, they fixed it. Halo is back. <clears throat> Shaman Priest Lady then starts talking shit to John Cheeks, because even though he's actively trying to kill the aliens that are threatening her colony, she is actually the wise one, because her method of protecting her planet that she hates is to just walk into this fire. Such a complex and beautiful character. I'm so glad we abandoned the original story so we could have this. We get what I can only assume is an Oblivion reference when Silver Team talks about complete nonsense. I watch programs sometimes. Programs? Like, about animals and stuff. Oh. Don't do that. I've been better. I hope things get better. Bye. Goodbye. Oh, hello. Then John Cheeks goes to rescue some marines that are trapped in some heavy fog. Only it gets complicated because they argue amongst themselves like actual children. Oh, for the last time. It is not a goddamn magnetic anomaly. Then a surprise mist monster appears and starts yoinking people into the stratosphere. Turns out there are camouflaged elites in the area, and once they get revealed, they fight much more normally instead of being this unstoppable yoink force. Unfortunately, John Cheeks fails to save any of these marines, but thankfully the elites simply decide not to fight the one that has plot armor. 
Her name is Perez, and we will see much more of her going forward. John Cheeks has an extended fight scene with the elites. The content of this scene is fine. I don't hate this, however the cinematography and CGI within the scene is incredibly mid, leaving the entire thing to be rather forgettable. This fight scene would be excellent if it were in a fan film, but this show is meant to be an official big budget production, so in comparison to the beautiful aesthetic of the games, I feel like we should expect better. Once the fight ends, John Cheeks and Perez get surrounded by a massive second wave of enemies, but this second wave just turns and leaves, so it's chill. Suddenly, massive plasma beams shoot down from the sky, as the Covenant begins to turn the planet into glass. I actually like seeing this. This is cool. This is some Halo shit. And that's important to point out, because we won't see it very often in this show. In the original story, the Human Covenant War begins with the Covenant attacking outer colonies like this, before making their way to more densely populated human worlds. The show giving us a more in-depth look on what went down during these moments is cool. Good job, show. However, like that last fight scene, the cinematography and effects just don't feel up to snuff. This planet is being turned to glass. This should be a major tragedy, but the way it's shot just makes it feel like another thing that is happening, being no more special than the moments of silly banter. It's getting a little warm in here. God, got me. Let's get an even more powerful music score. Scenes of civilians in complete terror, people mourning their dying planet, heroic marines trying to carry children to safety, stuff like that. But nah, the shaman people just walk into the fire, and everyone else just hops out of there without really giving us time to feel the impact of the moment. Like, they show people dying and running, sure, but we don't really get to stick with them and feel the emotional impact. The pacing of the show just moves on very quickly. We see a ship get blasted out of the sky, but we don't see any of the people that were inside it. And aside from an ADR scream, we don't see any terror or sadness from the surrounding people. It also doesn't help that all the characters being featured are clowns. You can call this criticism a nitpick, because this is one of the better scenes in the show, but this is still worth talking about. Before she dies, the shaman priest person tells Cheeks to find his faith as she believes that he will die soon. We shall see if this topic comes back later. We then cut to the intro, and oh wow, actual Halo music. Thank you, show. Very cool. Unfortunately, it's tainted by the visual of John Cheeks and his bare booty. Oh look, the Halo. That's probably the only time we're gonna see that thing in this season. Imagine making a Halo show and setting it in a time before anyone actually encounters a Halo. Big brain move right there. After the intro, we see John Cheeks continue to live up to his name as he takes a shower. With this being the third shot of him without clothes this season, it's as if the showrunners had all the feedback from season one and just decided to double down on all the problems out of spite. After the super necessary shower scene, Silver Team gets a mission debriefing from Captain Keys, or I guess his name is Admiral Keys, as he is apparently doing this nonsense instead of doing what he is more well known for, you know, being the captain of his ship, since he is Captain Keys. And I'm sorry, along with his appearance, how is this guy meant to be Keys in any way? They basically just made up a new character and then they just plucked a random name from the game manual in this half ass attempt to make this show an adaptation. This whole scene is here to set up a lot of goofy shit. So this new guy shows up to apparently take over from the previously in charge Dr. Halsey, and we get this dialogue. Sir, if I may, who the hell is this guy? That's some great military discipline right there. I'm sure all superiors love to be talked to that way. John Cheeks states that the Covenant attacked on the ground, as well as attacking from their ship. But for some reason, Keys and this new boss gaslight Cheeks and don't believe him, thinking that the Covenant would only ever attack from their ship. Then they go back and forth bickering over this issue. Why does it matter? Don't really know, but apparently it's a big deal, so we're going to be hearing about it a lot. But like... The Covenant are going to try and kill everyone either way, and everyone at least agrees to that. So why must we have this big debate over the change in their methods? They might attack us from the ground, they might shoot us with lasers, either way humanity dies. On top of all of this, we are veering very far from the original story here, so it is difficult to care. One more thing worth noting, is that it is incredibly irritating and out of character to see Chief out of his armor and having these petty emotional arguments. I don't want to repeat myself many times over, but just know that anytime he is out of his helmet, I am seething. And it is particularly annoying because Halo has many other characters that could more accurately fill this role. If you don't want to use Master Chief as he is, then why not just use Johnson or Buck or Carter or basically anybody else? There are many pre-existing and well-liked Halo stories that don't feature Master Chief at all, so fans are already comfortable with not having him around all the time. So if you don't want him, just don't use him. But what you shouldn't do is take some random guy and call him Master Chief when this guy hardly resembles Chief in any way at all. Master Chief 
Chief is known to be a stoic figure who lets his actions speak louder than his words, and he is revered by friends and enemies alike for all the good that he has accomplished. Seeing him get frustrated and emotional like any other normal guy just isn't accurate. And do you know why people get so upset when they see his face? It's because he is meant to be a stand-in for the player, and he used to look however you wanted him to look. There's nothing inherently wrong with the actor they chose, it's simply the case that no actor would be sufficient. Plus, if the helmet were to ever come off, it should be treated as a monumental moment, not just some casual Friday. That just kills the magic of the character. It's like going to see a magician and he just tells you all of his tricks before he performs them. And I suspect the writers might clap back at this by saying, Uh, a show about a guy who never talks and emotes would be boring, because he wouldn't have any struggles or relatability. Again, if you don't want to use this character, just pick a different one. But also, a better writer could get it done. Chief resembles Captain America in the sense that he himself does not change, and the suspense of the story usually does not revolve around if he will survive. Chief will probably win every fight he is in, and he will probably complete all of his mission objectives. However, his struggle comes in keeping everyone else alive along the way. After all, he is still just one man in a massive war. His story in Halo 1 could be considered a tragedy, since he failed in his quest to keep the crew of the Pillar of Autumn alive. Instead of taking away all of his unique qualities, these writers should be celebrating these traits because they make for a more unique protagonist that doesn't come around very often. Turning him into basic soldier archetype is the death of creativity. Plus, there are pre-existing story elements that can make this character easier to work with, if you take advantage of them. You want more dialogue? Cortana is almost always around to fill that role. You want more dynamic characters? Cut to somebody else. Halo has plenty of well-liked characters to work with. The point of this whole tangent is just to say that if the showrunners knew what they were doing, they could have had so many options to tell a compelling story while also not pissing everyone off. After this scene, we cut to a slave trade. Mm -hmm. Getting a glimpse into the more civilian slash underground side of humans in Halo is something we don't get to see a whole lot of in the games and could be an interesting aspect of the world to expand upon. Let's see how they do. <laughs> Never mind, I missed the life I had before I watched this. <sighs> Regardless, excluding the cringe, this scene is just here to establish that these space pirates want to buy this goober child because he knows where Dr. Halsey is, with Dr. Halsey being the woman who invented the Spartan program. We'll speak more on this topic in a sec. Later we see John Cheeks meet with a new boss so that they can have another argument over Covenant attack plans. John Cheeks thinks that the Covenant are attacking outer colonies in order to train themselves for a larger scale invasion. New Boss thinks that this idea is so absurd that Cheeky Chief must be mentally disabled in order to come to this conclusion. Have you ever experienced hallucinations? What? It is all very strange, because surely it is very reasonable to think that enemies you are at war with will attack larger targets eventually. Either this new boss has some hidden motive, or he is Looney Tune levels of stupid. But even if he had a hidden motive, what useful purpose could there be to gaslighting John Cheeks during a private meeting? Who knows, maybe this will make sense eventually. The ONI has since become aware of- Wait, did he just say ONI? Oni. 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 Your vest looks stupid, by the way. In the next scene, we get a cameo from the chief. Time, you want some noobs? Imagine making an internet show that only uses action figures of faceless and inhuman characters to relate to the audience with, and it actually becomes a success because it's clever and well-written. Nah, that could never happen. We need real faces in order to have relatable characters. What's next? You'll tell me that the world's longest-running web series will be made using red and blue copies of the same character model of Halo's multiplayer, and it'll actually work because the writing and voice acting is strong enough to launch a multi-million dollar corporation, fit with streaming deals and yearly conventions? That would just be absurd. Absurd. You cannot have a relatable show unless we see the protagonist's ass every five seconds. As the show goes on, we get more of the B-plot, in which this pirate Spartan argues with his wife. I saw the look in your eyes when that boy said her name. It's the same look you get every time some poor desperate fool comes in here claiming- And I really don't care about this. I'm sorry, we're not gonna cover it. Later on, the ever bare John Cheeks is in the locker room with his team, as they watch the news. In which, Admiral Keyes is giving the previously mentioned Perez an award and all the credit for evacuating all the people off this colony in the opening scene. Silver team is upset by this, but I have to wonder why. Are they jealous? Do they care about getting accolades? They didn't in the games. What do these people want? New boss guy lies about the role of John Cheeks and his team, as he claims they are too busy fighting to be here, when in reality they are just chilling in this locker room. Why does this plot point have to be a thing? Hopefully we find out someday. Suddenly another team of Spartans shows up, and are like, Hey, why do you guys get all the credit and we don't? As if that whole newsreel wasn't just them not getting credit. 
Then they have this argument with wild dialogue that screams, I want to write cool and tough characters, but I have no idea what being cool and tough looks like. I heard they brought home a bunch of empty coffins. Yeah, put you in one, bitch. You Sorry, Riz. Suck, big ass cream. Boy. I'm about to wear you like a sock. These writers Fuck should go on strike to yes. get paid better. <laughs> Look at these goofy goobers. These are supposed to be artificially enhanced super soldiers that were raised from birth to be perfect warriors. Yet they talk, look, and act like absolute clowns. And there's something you may have noticed at this point, in that everyone in this show hates each other. Because if Halo is known for anything, it's how divided its humans are. But maybe they're creating all this human conflict with the intention of showing everyone growing and coming together once times get really tough. We'll see. There's also something to be said about the hefty amount of screen time that the Spartans get, but we'll save that for a discussion towards the end of the series. I have a lot of strong opinions about where they started this story in the timeline, but I want to see how it plays out before we go there. John, Cheeks, and New Boss then have argument three about this gaslighting situation, and it is three times as obnoxious. I'm not irrational. experiencing any residual impact. side effects. No sir. Memory. Negative Emotional. sir. This show sucks, man. What are we doing? I am ordering you. To surrender that AI! No, sir. Lieutenant! Arrest that man! Captain! Arrest him! Captain! Get word to Earth that trouble is coming. Cortana and I will do what we can back here. We go back to the space pirate as he has an awkward conversation with his child. There's no such thing as Moses. Do you swear on my life? Later we see John Cheeks go incognito Thor style. He randomly encounters this lady who claims that she believes his story, and wants him to give her more info whenever he gathers it. Then the space pirates go looting for treasure while wearing these unflattering space suits. And this is a nitpick, but this guy is meant to be a former Spartan himself. Yet he struggles with the magnet boots the same way that the normal human does. Long time ago. I find the lack of attention to detail disturbing. Turns out this slave boy is an undercover cop, and he captures this pirate while his crew betrays him and escapes. Under arrest. <laughs> Oof, that choreography. And for a super soldier, he went down very easy. We cut back to John Cheeks as he goes to AI therapy to vent about his insecurities. You know, typical Master Chief stuff. So this therapist is meant to imitate Cortana, but not as we previously knew her, but rather as this new person that we haven't seen yet. Cheeks is in despair because he can't get this therapist to look right, which is ironic because the real her looks completely different now, and she still doesn't look how she's originally supposed to. It's very confusing and stupid. Cheeks tells her to shut up, just like he does with the real Cortana. You don't have to do that. Do what? Talk. I need you to do me a favor. Anything. Stop talking. And he fumbles around awkwardly with the character creator until his session expires, which was about two minutes long. You can change it. I know, I can change it. I don't... <clears throat> oh darn. Looks like our time's up. The Halo show, everybody. They fixed it. Why would you want to watch humanity go to war with aliens when we could have this? Good thing they didn't play the games, because this is way better. The episode closes out with this woman showing up, so get hyped for that. Now, episode 2 is a slog, so we're just going to speed run through this one. We open with Dr. Halsey herself. And she looks very youthful, considering she raised this guy since childhood. This girl shows up to talk about pomegranates. And then when you take a bite, the seeds just pop, pop, pop in your mouth like little balloons filled with juice. And then some Stranger Things bullshit happens. Then John Cheeks and his team get pissy because the other team that they hate went missing on their last mission. We then see Quan, everyone's favorite Halo character, as she runs away from these evil dudes. We then cut to Riz, everyone's other favorite character, as she cries when this blind guy touches her battle scars. Then Cheeks and New Boss argue over gaslighting again. Then the pirate people talk about pirate stuff. And Quan tells this kid that his dad will die. He's not coming back! Later, Silver Team does some training with this super great CGI. During said training, Riz struggles with previous battle wounds, and John Cheeks tries to kill her for it. Taking the shot. Chief! <sighs> Dr. Halsey returns with an identical scene to the first one. She wants this dying girl to describe some specific man, but the girl keeps passing out before saying anything. His name. 
Love it, this is what Halo fans were waiting for. Then this blind guy tells Riz how he became blind. New boss meets with Kai to try and get her to spill some tea over John Cheeks' mental problems. John Cheeks tries to confront Perez in order to gather more information as to why the new boss is being so difficult. However, he ends up staying for dinner with her soulful, quirky Hispanic family. It is an endearing, wholesome, complete waste of time that'll make you say, wow, these people are humans. They have emotions and are like me. This is the type of scene you think of when you think of Halo, right? Who wants to explore ancient artifacts that were built eons before the modern man, when we could have a cutesy little family dinner that has nothing to do with anything? During said dinner, this little rascal of a brother asks John Cheeks what his kill-death ratio is. It's okay, DR. Kill death ratio? It's the kind of writing that screams, how do you do fellow kids? Gamers like KDs, right? Let's put a KD reference in the show. That'll get them to stop complaining. You know, because that sort of dialogue just translates perfectly well to real life. Given how often real soldiers die and respawn in the field. You freaking idiot! This dinner is intercut with Riz who is in the process of getting force healed when this random guy puts his hand on her back and tells her words of affirmation. Your life is yours. What is happening? Eventually, Cheeky Chief validates Perez and goes on his way. We rejoin Halsey as she talks with a new boss about pomegranates. There was a pomegranate tree in my father's garden in Port Vernon. It's worth noting that Halsey talks with an English accent, which is just out of character, especially since the original voice actress is already in the show. If you don't know, she's supposed to have the same voice as Cortana, because Cortana is modeled directly after her. The scene ends with a revelation that Halsey's being trapped in a simulated room. What does it mean? Not sure, but maybe we'll find out someday. New Boss then reveals that Cortana is hidden away, and Cortana provides him with information on Dr. Halsey. With this new body actress, Cortana's design has been heavily altered from her Season 1 look, but she still looks way worse than she does in the game. I don't know why it's so hard for these people to just get it right. One nice thing to say about the show is that pretty much everything else looks the way it's supposed to. Cortana seems to confirm John Cheeks' story to the new boss, implying that he secretly was taking Cheeks' warning seriously. She then seems to imply that humanity is doomed to lose this war. Interesting stuff. John Cheeks then learns that the team that went missing early in the episode never actually left the planet. So he rallies his team to go rescue them, but he leaves them fuzzy on the details of what they're doing. After that, we cut to a Rogue One-style marine slaughter, where these guys just blindly shoot into an empty black hallway. Then when that yields no results, one group of marines gets sent to walk blindly into the darkness. Then whoopsie, an alien appears and kills them all. So how do these other marines respond? They send a second group to walk blindly into the darkness. And guess what? The same alien just waits for them to get close and then kills them all. Who could have seen that coming? If only they had guns that could shoot long distances. Then, as said alien kills the last man, this villainous woman from season one appears and starts bitching at him. He opens a door that leads to some blue. She touches the blue. Then the episode ends. Episode 3 starts with Silver Team continuing their rescue mission, while being intercut with scenes of Perez sleeping. I believe Perez is meant to be a stand-in for the audience here. Just as Silver Team gets close to their destination, these people, presumably Marines, stop them, and reveal the truth to Silver Team, in that John Cheeks lied to them and made up this mission without getting proper authorization to do so. This is why it is important to distinguish between John Cheeks and Master Chief, because they are not the same person. We get this very very confusing edit. But then Cheeks appears to stand down, as we hard cut to the new boss as he is shaving an old man, while the old man tells the story of how he peed on someone. You peed on uncloth. I peed on him. Oh. What is this show? Where's all the Halo shit? There are so many other things we could be doing. But no, instead we have to sit here and listen to this. If I wasn't trying to review the show, I would have stopped watching a long time ago. <sighs> Anyway, the old man is his dad, and he's here so that the writers can take advantage of dementia for cheap pity points. So when's she coming? Your sister? She's gone, Dad. After that, Silver Team gets chewed out by Cap... Admiral Keys for going on an unsanctioned mission. He also gets decommissioned from active duty until he can perform a psyche val. Admiral Keys is a stooge for the man. Captain Keys was way better. And John Cheeks goes off in an unhinged rant about how they're being lied to. However, his team loses faith in him and walk away against his wishes. I'm trying to talk to you as your friend. I don't need a friend, Betty Officer. I need a Spartan. 125, you are not dismissed! I don't mean to be a broken record, but holy shit, this is not Master Chief. Getting all emotional like this, and getting disrespected by his peers, is not what this character is about. 
we get more pirate shenanigans, but I can't be asked to care, so we're moving on. You may push back at me for this and say, hey, you're not giving this show a chance. But here's the deal. These showrunners don't deserve the benefit of the doubt after season one, and they haven't earned any of my investment as an audience member. I want to be open to seeing new sides of the Halo universe, but this crap right here is so basic and boring, so I don't care, and I don't want to talk about it. It's not cringy, it's not funny to laugh at, it's just boring. John Cheeks is being led to a psyche eval until he assaults his escorts. Not sure how he plans to avoid getting executed at this point, but let's wait and see. In the next scene, Riz joins this blind man and his force-healing husband for dinner. No, 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 don't listen to him. His idea of date night ends with him falling asleep listening to the sat link and me doing the dishes. Babe, you don't do the dishes, the machine does. Someone has to press the button. Shut up! Oh my god, I don't care! These dinner scenes are really fitting given that there isn't a single one across any of the games. This is the whole scene, by the way. They don't actually develop the plot here. Later, Kai meets with a new boss, and she learns about how Cheeks has been punching people in the elevator. A new boss pushes her to turn on him. We get more scenes of Quan and friends as they try to sneak this pirate ship away. But this blonde woman gets captured and is real sad. Don't worry though, they make her look really strong and independent before she goes down. She puts up a better fight than her Spartan husband did. Anyway, we learn that the missing Spartan team is actually dead. A new boss reveals to Captain... <sighs> Admiral Keys, that he does in fact believe John Cheeks' story. Why doesn't he just tell John Cheeks this instead of avoiding all this drama? Because drama overrides logic in the world of poorly written TV. He is also acting the way he does based on Cortana's calculations. He believes that humanity and the planet Reach are already doomed, but he also doesn't want to incite panic so he's trying to keep secrets. So, I hate this for a lot of reasons. Firstly, dude, you're facing a doomsday scenario. You gotta talk about it. You gotta evacuate people. You gotta go to war. This cover-up conspiracy stuff on the grounds of avoiding panic is just a forced waste of time. It's just fluff to pad out the show's runtime. Also, it's annoying that the characters in this show already know how it's going to end. They talk about the war as if it's already lost, even though it's just starting, simply because the writers themselves also know the ending. There's no room for suspense or subversions here. They've already spoiled it. In the game, the defenders of Reach legitimately thought that they had a chance of winning, only for a haunting plot twist to slap them down just when they thought it was over. Can I count on you? Go fuck yourself. Alright dude, don't you just love the Hollywood military? Where people can talk all kinds of shit to their superiors with zero repercussions? This pirate handcuffs this woman to a wall. Very cool. Then John Cheeks returns in, you guessed it, yet another dinner scene. What is he talking about? The same shit he's always been talking about. Just getting emotional and ranting about how he's being lied to. Like... I get it dude, but can you please just do something about it instead of just bitching all the time? Cheeks is meeting with the elevator woman from earlier, but is surprised to learn that she is a secret agent for the ONI. Who could have guessed that the random elevator woman that knew way more than she should wasn't trustworthy? Wow. I believe the Covenant is here. In the Raman. Some advice for the future to whoever's writing this. Please go out and take a lunch break and eat some food before you finish your script, you hungry bastards. New boss and Dr. Halsey talk a lot. And then the pirate Spartan gets placed in this room as well. We get even more pirate stuff. So, whatever. It's just more sitting and talking. They decide to kill this woman, but they do it Dr. Evil style, so naturally she survives. Alright guard, begin the unnecessarily slow moving dipping mechanism. You have... One minute. Quan then kills all the pirates, though most of this happens off screen. The new boss then kills his dad. Okay. John Cheeks then talks to Perez about how unhelpful it is to go to church. People come here for comfort, for protection, for answers. Do they find them? Sometimes. Do you? Lovely. Perez then shares a message from an elite, saying that they are going to attack soon. This would be a neat reveal, if only we didn't already know this information since the opening of episode 1. This whole conspiracy plot point only serves to offer endless scenes of people sitting and talking about the same crap over and over and over. Like enough people, please move on. <sighs> Anyway, everything explodes and the episode ends. This show sucks and it's a chore to watch. 